Hi and welcome to Train Signal. We're continuing our discussion of advanced services in Windows Server 2012. We're shifting gears into a discussion of Hyper-V, Microsoft's virtualization platform, and ways in which I can incorporate clustering technologies to be able to enhance that environment. So Globomantix has rolled out their new Hyper-V virtualization environment. The boss is delighted to see that we're taking what used to be five physical servers worth of work, stacking them together in virtual machines on the same physical server. There's been a vast reduction in the costs associated with the electrical consumption of those computers, reductions in cooling costs. It's having a big impact on the bottom line. Boss is delighted. But we've got a potential problem. The boss says, well, wait a minute. Now that I think about it, now that we've got all these five servers worth of stuff on one server, in some ways we're more vulnerable than we used to be. Because it used to be we had five servers. If one server quit, we only lost one server worth of functionality because there was only one servers worth of stuff on one server. But now we've got what used to be five servers worth of work being done on one server. And if that server goes offline, we've lost five servers worth of functionality, or what used to be five servers worth of functionality. The boss is right. We're in a position where, from a certain point of view, virtualization makes us more vulnerable than less in some ways. So what do you do about it? Well, a good virtualization strategy really needs a good, strong, high availability strategy. I need some way to be able to make sure that when I build my virtual machines that I've got more than one place to be able to run them from. So if one of my hosting servers needs to go down for maintenance or because of an actual catastrophe, that the functionality associated with that virtual machine will still be available. So there's a couple ways of going about this process. We've got a technique for host clustering. This is building physical servers running both Hyper-V and Microsoft's failover cluster software. This course doesn't go into much detail on Hyper-V deployment. I invite you to consider the other Server 2012 courses in our curriculum. This course, though, does have a fairly strong emphasis on failover clusters. If you haven't taken the failover cluster lessons that are part of this course, I invite you to check those out. Those will form a good bit of underpinning of what we're going to do. These lessons on Hyper-V failover clustering really rely on a number of constituent pieces. The discussion of iSCSI is relevant here. Certainly the discussion of failover clustering is relevant here. That being said, a host clustered environment is one in which we've got servers that are both running Hyper-V and the failover clustering software together on the same box. The failover cluster clusters together a group of physical servers, as few as two, as many as 32 in Server 2012. And in that circumstance, our virtual machines are the highly available resource that fails over from one failover cluster node to the other, which is to say one Hyper-V server to another. The failover cluster software monitors the virtual machine, and if the VM hits a problem, it fails over to the other failover cluster node, and suddenly it's running from over there instead. A second approach to clustering that takes advantage of failover clustering software is a technique in which virtual machines on one server are clustered together using failover clustering. In which case, what's being passed around within that cluster is the actual applications running on those virtual machines. So an application can fail over from one VM to another VM. If one VM goes down, the other VM can pick up the slack and perform whatever the functions are of that server. It's worth noting that a hybrid variation on that theme is to do host clustering of physical Hyper-V servers and then to be able to use guest clustering within that host clustered environment to cluster together some of the VMs that lie inside of that host clustered environment to be able to allow the applications running on those VMs to fail over from one to the other. A third approach uses the network load balancing technology. Network load balancing again is the focus of another lesson in this same course. NLB allows us to be able to route a request to a group of servers. That request hits all the servers in that group simultaneously and through the magic of the network load balancing algorithm one of those computers is going to respond to that request. NLB is a great choice for applications that involve maybe a front-end web server that front-ends some other database-driven application. Where the front-end application doesn't preserve state, it's just a conduit to access information on the back-end, in which case it doesn't really matter exactly which server responds because any one of them is going to answer identically to any other. As long as that's the case, NLB is a fine solution. If the server we're going to connect to is going to store some information locally on that computer, such that next time that user connects and they really need to get back to that same data, NLB might not be the best choice. But that being said, assuming that that's the case, 
I can network load balance a group of virtual machines. Build a set of VMs, build them together into a network load balancing cluster, and I get the nice scalability benefits of NLB, allowing a large quantity of incoming requests to be divvied up among a large number of virtual computers. So no one computer gets overwhelmed with all that traffic. If we're going to be doing clustering of virtual machines in the Hyper-V, probably a Hyper-V slash failover cluster environment, there's a number of technologies we need to make sure are working in order to be able to take advantage of that fully. One important one is CSV, Cluster Shared Volumes. One of the critical technological underpinnings of failover clustering logic is that the two servers, or the 32 servers, are able to have some application that was on one server suddenly begin working on another. And that can't happen if the data associated with some application is present only on the hard drive of one of those servers, but not on another. The data associated with that application needs to be accessible from all of my failover cluster nodes so that the application can fail over from one node to another and still be workable there. CSVs, cluster shared volumes, are a kind of shared storage accessible to failover clusters in Server 2012. This was actually a feature that was introduced in Server 20.R2. The magic of which is that it allows multiple failover cluster servers to be able to control access to the same SAN LUN, logical unit number. It might be an iSCSI disk. It might be a LUN from a fiber channel SAN. Whatever the storage mechanism is, it used to be that only one failover cluster host could have its fingers in a particular logical unit number at any given time. And because that was the case, I couldn't really sensibly put two virtual machines in the same LUN, the same logical unit number, because if those two VMs needed to roam to two different failover cluster nodes, only one of those two failover cluster nodes could control the LUN that the virtual machine sat in. CSV fixed that. The failover cluster nodes can cooperate with each other, can nominate one of their number as a coordinator node. And the coordinator fields requests from other failover cluster nodes, routing requests to the contents of that particular SAN LUN. That's neat. Benefit is multiple VMs in the same LUN. That's fantastic. I don't have to create individual LUNs for each virtual machine, which is what we used to do back in Server 2008. SMB 3.0 is another important enabling technology. SMB is the technology that undergirds Microsoft's shared folders. If I create a shared folder, I'm creating an SMB share. Microsoft gave SMB a facelift in Server 2012, largely with the idea in mind of being able to support a couple of interesting scenarios. One is something called a scale-out file server, where I can have multiple file servers in a failover cluster where they are acting in a kind of a load balancing sort of a scenario, kind of like NLB. That's very different from what we usually do with failover cluster. Usually a, a role runs on exactly one of the servers in our failover cluster and can roam to other services need be. In a scale out file server scenario, we've got multiple failover cluster servers, each of which are providing access to the same set of files. SMB 3.0 supports that. And SMB3 supports the use of virtual machines whose files live not in shared SAN storage in the failover cluster, but instead on just a shared folder on some other server in my network. The efficiency of communication, the multi-accessor capabilities of SMB3 allow for that same kind of shared access to work in a way that we couldn't do in Server 28R2. SMB version 2 didn't have that capability. So one of those two approaches will provide the redundant storage that's needed to make our environment work. The final component is redundant connectivity. Microsoft recommends having multiple network connections linking the failover cluster nodes in your environment. And that's because a failover cluster does a number of different things all at the same time. There's cluster traffic, that's heartbeat information passing back and forth between the failover cluster nodes as they communicate with each other about their status. There's management traffic as you connect in from some client machine using the failover cluster manager tool to manage the failover cluster. There's client traffic, requests coming in from users who want to use the resources of the failover cluster. We may have a dedicated network with which to do live migration as we roam our virtual machines from one failover cluster node to another. 
we might need yet another if we're using iSCSI to be able to provide iSCSI based connectivity to our failover cluster nodes. So yes, it's entirely possible to imagine designing a failover cluster scenario in which each of your physical failover cluster servers has something like five network adapter cards in it. Just the challenge of setting up the networking and getting all of the IP addresses correct, setting up each of those networks to have its own separate subnet ID is a meaningful administrative challenge in and of itself before we even start the process of getting ready to turn this into a Hyper-V failover cluster. Once we're ready to do, actually roll out the technology, the basic procedure is fairly straightforward. We need shared storage. That might be an SMB3 share. It might be iSCSI or Fiber Channel SAN. We'll then install Hyper-V and the failover cluster features. Hyper-V is a role, failover cluster is a feature. Those will be installed from Server Manager in a way that you've seen before. If you're unclear on how to roll out a favorite failover cluster, I'm not going to demonstrate it in this particular lesson. There are other lessons in this course that focus on failover cluster functionality. They're worth a visit. Having installed those important features, our next step is going to be to validate that cluster. Remember that Microsoft support services will not support your failover cluster unless the hardware is certified for Windows Server 2012. So look for the certified for Server 2012 label and they'll insist that your cluster be validated. They will want to know for sure that you have run the validate a cluster wizard and done a full suite of tests against that cluster to validate that everything looks good. The validate tool really acts very well as a practical troubleshooting tool. If your cluster is acting strangely you can rerun the validation wizard at any time and confirm that the system seems to be doing what it's supposed to or it'll identify for you exactly what the particular problem is in that cluster. Having done all those things, we're ready to go ahead and create the virtual machine that's going to roam from one failover cluster node to another. And we've got a couple of ways of going about that that I want to take a moment to walk you through. So let's just jump over to my test servers and we'll take a look and see how setting up a failover cluster with Hyper-V looks. So here I am on one of my Hyper-V servers. This is Hyper-V Host 1, one of two that are clustered together. Hyper-V Host 1, Hyper-V Host 2 are my matched set. I can see at the moment I've got a test virtual machine running on Hyper-V Host 1. That is a standard Hyper-V virtual machine of the same sort that I would see if I only had one Hyper-V server. And it has limited high availability prospects. We're going to hope the server has redundant hard drives on redundant drive controllers connected to a motherboard connected to redundant power supplies, connected to different electrical circuits, that sort of thing. But even so, my motherboard is a point of failure. What happens if the, if the motherboard goes on the fritz? Well, my whole server goes down. Take my VM with me. Well, I could, in advance of that happening, take my virtual machine, right-click it, and move it to some other host. But, of course, that only is a meaningful thing to do before my server crashes. What do I do in a case where the server might go down at any moment, we don't know when or why, and I want that VM's functionality to be available again as soon as possible? Well, failover cluster is the logical solution. So let me go ahead and pull up my failover cluster software. This server again already has Hyper-V on it. That was already installed. It's already got the failover cluster manager software installed. We showed you how to do that in the failover cluster lessons. And this cluster we can see is characterized by the presence of two nodes, host one, host two. At the moment, host one has no particular resources on it. And host two is hosting no clustered roles. Now you're thinking, well, wait a minute, there's that virtual machine. Well, yes, but it is not yet a highly available virtual machine. That is a manual process on the part of whoever runs the failover cluster software to choose to incorporate that virtual machine into the operations of this failover cluster. So let me go ahead and do that. I'm going to right-click my roles container and choose to configure a role. After reading the basics about high availability, I'll click Next and choose which role I want to configure and I get my choice of again a DFS server, a DHCP server, these sorts of things and way down here virtual machine. When I click next it wants to know which virtual machine I want to configure for high availability. I'll go ahead and choose the test VM. The cluster is ready to make test VM a highly available virtual machine. I'll click next and it's going to go ahead and get that set up for me. A helpful report shows me what sorts of concerns the cluster environment has with this particular node. Let me go pull up the report. 
and it's warning me that the ISO image that I use to be able to install this virtual machine is only available on one node of my cluster. So if I were to migrate that virtual machine to the other node, we would see a circumstance where that file isn't on that machine and therefore wouldn't be available. So in this case, I would just unmap that ISO from the Hyper-V settings for that virtual machine. I don't need that DVD in there anymore. I can disassociate it. So otherwise, that particular virtual machine looks great. And I can see it is now a hosted role of Hyper-V host 1. It's not on host 2. It is on host 1. And that virtual machine has recourse to all the other benefits that are associated with being a clustered role, including the ability to move that role from one Hyper-V host to another, from one clustered node to another. I can trigger my own kind of failover in a manual sort of way here. We'll address the details of these various different types of migration in another lesson. But the other thing that I can do from here is to create an entirely new virtual machine from scratch. Let me go right click my roles container and there's a virtual machines menu here within which I can build a new VM specifying here on which node I want to create the VM. Let me do it on Hyper-V host 1 for starters. I'll click OK. Having done that I'll click next to start my wizard. It needs a name for that virtual machine. Cluster demo. And it wants to know where I want to store my VM. Now by default, it's offering C slash program data Microsoft Windows Hyper-V. Very traditional place to put virtual machine information. In this case though, I don't want this to be in just any old folder of this server. Because I want it to be able to roam to the other servers in this cluster. And that's only going to work if that data is in some place accessible from all those servers. And that location is going to be my CSV. Let me cancel out of my wizard for just a moment to point out that my storage environment does contain a set of disks. I've got a small quorum disk of a gigabyte in size. I probably could have gotten away with something as small as 512, but I like the nice round number. So that is a quorum disk. It's part of my node and disk majority quorum strategy. And I've got two CSV LUNs available here. These are you coming off of iSCSI, off of the domain controller in this particular environment. I've got a 40 gig disk and a 30 gig disk. So it would be on those locations that I would really like to put my data. So where do those live? I can actually see down here that that volume, that disk, is actually associated with C slash cluster storage slash volume 1. This one slash volume 2. It is those paths that I can use to specify where I want to put my new virtual machines files. So let me do just exactly that. I'm going to again right click roles, start the process of building a new virtual machine. I'll host it here on host one to start with. It may wander, it may migrate elsewhere later. In my wizard I'm going to say yes, I've intended to create a virtual machine whose name is going to be failover demo. I'm going to store that virtual machine in a different location where the location is going to be C drive. cluster storage and there's volume 1, volume 2. I can see volume 1 has my test VM directory. Volume 2 has got some other virtual machine data. Volume 2 looks like a good choice. Let me use that. Clicking next I get my choice of how much startup RAM. Let me throw a gigabyte of memory at this. Do I want to support dynamic memory which is a wonderful feature. Virtual machines in Hyper-V and Server 2012 can exhibit dynamic memory behavior where I can specify a specific startup RAM allocation for that server. As the server runs, I can allocate a greater or lesser amount of RAM on the fly, which is to say Hyper-V will deliberately calibrate how much RAM is being allocated to a virtual machine strictly in response to the demand generated by that virtual machine. If that computer is quiet, it's not doing a lot of work, we'll back off on the amount of RAM that it's consuming. If it gets terribly busy and needs a lot of RAM, we will bump up the amount of RAM we allocate to it. That allows me to put more virtual machines on the same host running simultaneously because we know that some number of them will be using a fairly small amount of memory most of the time. Some of them will be using a very large amount of RAM most of the time. And most will have some variability in there. 
but by being able to economize on the use of RAM for servers that don't need them at a given moment, that frees up precious resources that I can use on more servers. Dynamic memory is a great choice. Clicking Next, we specify which virtual switch I want to attach my virtual machine to. Ethernet's a good choice. So it's offering me the option to create a new virtual hard disk. Uh, I've already got an existing one, so I'm going to choose to use that instead. Let me go browse for that. That is located again in my shared storage area. C drive, cluster storage, volume 2. There it is, Mike's Windows 8 VHD. Let's build a Windows 8 client computer, shall we? Nothing says a virtual machine always has to be a server. Clicking Next, we're ready to build our virtual machine. We click Finish, and it's going to build a VM, and it's going to flag it as being highly available. Because it's highly available, it is a cluster role. It is something that can flow from one Hyper-V host to another from one failover cluster node to the other. We've successfully made that highly available. Looks good. I click Finish. The moment the virtual machine is turned off, but I can throw a right click at it, and I have access to all of my Hyper-V virtual machine controls right from here, including the ability to configure settings on that VM. If this machine is a highly available virtual machine, I want to be able to have it migrate perhaps from one node to another within the same cluster, but there's a potential challenge there. One of the migration techniques we're going to explore is going to be to migrate a virtual machine from one host to another in, virtually speaking, real time in such a way that the client connected to that virtual machine is unaware of the change to the computer during that time frame. For that to work, we need to be able to translate what's happening not only on the hard drive, not only what's happening in RAM, but what's happening in the processor of a virtual machine and translate that from one computer onto another at a very high rate of speed. That works best if the processors, the actual CPU chips on the source and destination failover cluster are identical. If they are, then I can neatly transplant a virtual machine from running on one server to another server and nobody knows the difference. It's called live migration and it's terribly cool. But what if my processors are slightly different? Well, then I can do one of two things. I can either shut down the virtual machine and then bring it up on the other server, in which case it detects the new processor and uses it just fine. Or I've got another option. I can go to the Hyper-V details of my new virtual machine and configure compatibility settings, telling this virtual machine that it's OK to migrate to a different server, even if it's using a slightly different version of the processor. That will cause this virtual machine to use a slightly smaller subset of the features of the processor of this computer so that it knows that it's not in any danger of doing something that will not be understood by the processor of the machine that I might potentially be migrated to. We click OK on that. We've committed that change. For illustration purposes, this particular cluster that I built is using two very different computers. If I go pull up the most recent validation report on this cluster, we'll see that the differences in processors between these two computers was one of the things that the failover cluster report dinged us on. It sees a warning in Hyper-V configuration. It says that the validation of matching processor manufacturers threw a warning. What's the warning? It says, hey, your processor version isn't consistent. Host 1 is using a later model of the same family of processors as is host 2. They're similar, they're Intel. Note that you can't in any way migrate from a machine running an Intel chip to one running an AMD. That just won't work. But chips that are part of the same processor family are fine. They're part of the same manufacturer, same family, that works well. If they're not perfectly identical though, I need to check that box that says use a subset of the features of the processor on the local machine so as to make sure I'm not doing something offensive to the server that I get moved to. Having done all that, I can right-click my failover demo virtual machine and start it up. The little progress meter way over off to the right here, uh, the information column, can usually be very handy when looking at what's happening on my virtual machines. We did see a starting message indicating that the system was preparing to bring that server 
in this case client machine, but that machine online. And it has done so, and we can actually see if I go click my miniature screen down here, it launches a RDP session to that virtual machine, and that OS is starting up nicely. So what you're seeing here is a number of technologies we've talked about all coming together. Support for failover clusters, support for CSVs, driven by the use of iSCSI, lots of things all coming together to produce this very, very nifty piece of functionality. So the next logical thing to do would be to test the migration of these virtual machines from one host to another. And I'll tell you all about that in another lesson. Come on back for that one and we'll talk about the actual migration strategies.